Hello and welcome to another edition of the Lelaine Pass It On podcast, where we talk to individuals who are passing on Jack's legacy of helping people help themselves. My name is Greg Justice, and I am here with the real star of the show, the First Lady of Fitness, Elaine. La la la, Elaine. How are you today, Elaine? Oh, I'm great today. You know, I'm uh, I'm uh, uh, anxious to talk to Bill Crawford, Crawford, because you know what? He doesn't know that I know a lot about about Arthur Jones and 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 the beginning of Nautilus and all that stuff. So. Anyway, we'll, we'll we'll get into that soon. Okay. <laughs> well, as Elaine mentioned, Bill Crawford is our special guest today. And Bill has been a visionary leader in the fitness industry since 1977. During the 70s, he found his way to Los Angeles and was one of the key players in the ignition of the fitness boom. He was fortunate to be one of the original providers of Nautilus and founded one of the very first Nautilus clubs in Los Angeles, which soon developed into a chain of clubs. Those clubs evolved into two national chains and actually launched the careers of many well-known fitness executives and personalities. Since 1997, Bill and his wife, Debbie, have been in Scottsdale, Arizona, where they have owned and operated Basic Training, which is a world-class, state-of-the-art fitness facility. I know firsthand because I've been there myself. Now, in 2012, Bill was inducted into the National Fitness Hall of Fame. In 2019, he received the Arthur Jones Lifetime Achievement Award from the Resistance Exercise Conference. And in 2023, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Fitness Hall of Fame. Bill, it is a pleasure to have you as our special guest today. Hi, Thank Bill. Thank you, Greg. What a, what a great introduction. Boy, you know more about me than I know about myself. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, and I, I, I got a word to tell you. <laughs> great, to, great to see you. <laughs> well, it, hey, it's, it's great, great to have, to have you, you as our guest today. today. So, so anyway, uh, I, I, can't, I can't wait to, to, to get into um, to Nautilus because, you know, of course, when Jack started, there was no Nautilus or anything like that. But, but uh, when Nautilus came in and Arthur Jones came up on the picture, you know, uh, he was quite, a, uh, quite, quite interesting. And, I'm, and we want to hear more about Arthur Jones because he was quite flamboyant, right? Is that right? Uh, am I right about that's, huh? that? That's an understatement. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, um, I, I have a story. Do you want to hear my story about uh, Arthur Jones? Yes. Okay. Yes, so, I do. Uh, Nautilus is just is just coming in, and and uh, Arthur Jones is is uh, coming on the scene, and he's big, and and everybody's going to joining Nautilus, and and uh, so I don't know. Jack was in Florida for some reason or another, and then I don't know how they got together, but. Arthur and Jack got together. He says, "Jack, I uh, I'm I'm going to fly you home." So uh, so he Jack called me up and he said, "You know I'm I'm don't pick me up at the airport because Arthur Jones is going to fly me home." And uh, and so he says, "Guess where I've been?" He says, "I've been in an alligator farm," and he says, "There's alligators yeah. all over the place." So now, Bill, we want to hear all about the alligators. And Arthur Jones and his alligators. You've got to know more than I do. Yeah. Hey, Bill, why don't you take us back to the the genesis of the story with you and Arthur? How did you meet him? How did you connect? And then tell us the the trajectory of that relationship. When I first got involved in, in the gym business, I had a partner. His name was AJ, AJ Rosenthal. And he was from Brooklyn, New York. And his brother was named Lenny Russell. This is when gyms were rat holes in Los Angeles. There might have been five gyms, and you had to go down a dark alley, down the stairs, into a dungeon, and there were concrete floors, broken mirrors, duct tape on the upholstery. I mean, it was pretty primitive. But uh, Arthur's brother, Lenny, had met this guy from New York that had these, these this new kinds of equipment, and it was called Nautilus equipment. 
And from what he, how he described it, it was above and beyond anything that we had seen or heard of. So we couldn't wait to find out. We went there and he had purchased a couple of pieces. So we tried it out and then we ended up meeting Arthur and we bought equipment from Arthur. And then we made a deal with him to provide Nautilus equipment to us because we were opening up a chain of clubs. And that's basically what we did. We opened up several, you know, Nautilus aerobic centers and, uh, it was it was unbelievable. It, it really was the ignition of that that first big wave. People couldn't get enough of it. Um, there were lines to get in the place. When we had specials, they were lined up down the street, sign up, and we opened up another club, another club, and another club. And uh, that that was it. And of course, I started a relationship with Arthur. I used to talk to him on the telephone and the orders. So he had a policy. Um, with the Nautilus equipment, you had to have a cashier. You know, you had to, first of all, you had to pay 50% of the order up front with the order. And then when the order was delivered, you had to have a cashier's check for the full balance before they take it off the truck. And when that big Nautilus truck pulled up in the parking lot and they opened up those doors, the smell of the, of the paint and the Naga hide and all the new equipment that we couldn't wait to find and, and to use was, was really quite, uh, quite thrilling. Something I'll never forget. Really enjoyed it. So, uh, I had a limited knowledge of Arthur's uh, ad advanced uh, engineering capabilities and the science behind the Nautilus equipment. So I used to go down and visit with him. We'd talk on the phone for hours and hours. I'd go to his seminars. And that was the beginning of our relationship. And I ended up representing him over in Europe in the uh, 50s. And, uh, spent a lot of time with him in Gainesville and Ocala. And uh, I learned a great deal from Arthur. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I was able to have that relationship. Yeah. Did you ever go to the alligator farm? I did. Which is, not only did he have alligators, he also had a bunch of elephants. So way back right. before he went into the bodybuilding business, Arthur had a TV show called Dangerous Cargo. Yeah. And he would go and film uh, episodes for television about uh, the exotic animals that he would trap and capture and probably sell. Um, but he had a real affection for the elephants and the alligators and dangerous snakes. At one point in time, he rescued, I can't remember how many elephants, but it was a lot of them. He took one of his 727s, gutted it out, flew down to Africa. There's a documentary somewhere, you can Google it. And he, and he rescued just a ton, tons, literally, of elephants. Flew him to that same ranch in uh, Deland, Ocala, and raised the elephants. I don't know whatever happened to him, but he he loved alligators. He loved uh, the exotic snakes. And when you came to visit Arthur for the first time, he would take you out into the elevator patch, like he did, you know, with Jack. And uh, it was it was it was really something to see because there were alligators everywhere. He's and Arthur had. Jack, you're not going to fly home on a. a you're you're going to fly home with me, so he says. I'm I'm going to I'm going to fly you home, so uh, so that's uh, uh, so after Jack saw the farm, he's he um I I I didn't even have to go. He was d delivered to the house. <laughs> now a, a, a side note to that story where he had the uh, alligator farm and all of that. And they, they had a big ranch in Ocala, and he had his own private airstrip. It was at, at the yeah. time it was the largest private jetway in the in the country. And uh, of course, Arthur passed away, and his former wife Terry uh, Jones ended up with the property, and she subdivided it and turned it into uh, multi-million dollar estates for people that had their own jets. And one of the one of the uh, residents of that compound is John Travolta. He's right on Arthur's old. Uh, old property there. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I've seen pictures of that. I didn't realize oh. that. Yeah. 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 So. Very interesting. Well, so your relationship with Arthur goes back um, it, back to the 70s. Now, today, here we sit in the year 2024. And again, as I mentioned earlier in the introduction, I have been to your facility. It is a state-of-the-art and first-class, world-class facility. And you've got... Thank you some of the most amazing Nautilus equipment. Uh, you can see some of it in the background. I don't know if you have the ability to show your gym on your camera there or if it's set, but we would love to see a, a little 
tour of your facility there with your camera. I don't know if you're able to do that, um, but that would be kind of that. Let me know if you want to do it now. Yeah, let's let's walk through. OK, so you can see the pictures on the wall of some of the celebrities and athletes that he's worked with. And he's got, again, some of the most amazing equipment that you'll ever see at any facility. Uh, perhaps every piece of Nautilus equipment ever made <laughs> uh, or, or a version of it there. I've got, well, I've club. got rare yeah. I, I wish I had some of the pieces that I had in Los Angeles, uh, but I don't, I simply don't have room for all of them, but I'm going to give yeah. you a tour. Yeah, that'd so, be great. I'd love to see it. This, this is the uh, lobby where we walk mm -hmm. in. Okay. And this is the room I do all of my private training. So when people are in here with me, uh, there's no other trainers, there's no other members. It's just uh, my my client and myself working on all of this equipment, eyeball to eyeball, no distractions. Nobody's trying to sell them anything. You don't have to wait for the equipment. Can you see the equipment? Yes. So, hey, Bill, do you do... Yeah, so this is... And we also have you know, dumbbells, barbells. Real... And this is the rehabilitation equipment. This is the MedX medical lumbar extension, cervical neck, rotational neck. I've seen these pieces of equipment work miracles with people that were scheduled for surgeries and they were able to come in and get their issues resolved without surgery. Now what I'm gonna do is take you over to the other side. This is the membership side of the facility. This is where people work out on, on their own and we how many square feet do you have equipment about it's somewhere between five and six thousand whoa and you can see we have quite a bit of cardio equipment yeah and this is more of the medx and we'll whoa. go back this way there's a there's a classic piece of nautilus there here's some of the classic pieces of nautilus equipment and this is the four-way neck machine mm -hmm. and our cardio. And Lala, we also have a grand piano that oh, we have in here. Great. This is where Charles played your happy birthday song. Oh, really? On the ago. birthday yep. video, yes. Yes, I remember. <laughs> God bless. Okay, so I'm going to go back in. Now, now, one thing you missed there, Bill, and I saw it in the background, was a good-looking image. Oh, yes. Let me go back. Hold on. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Hold on. I saw it in the background. There it is. There it is. I There's the endless you. rope. People <laughs> love this piece of equipment. They absolutely love it. That's awesome. <laughs> Glad I have it. Hey, Bill, when you work with your personal training clients, is it just one person at a time in the gym? Yes, one person yeah. at a time. Yeah, I, uh, I, I decline working with couples and groups because <laughs> the way that I do it and the and the kind of a training that I want to give them, it would be a distraction and everybody's a little bit different. Exactly. And I just uh, I just don't want to do that model. Now, there's people that have, you know, I, sometimes I call them training mills where they personal training mills where they'll have one trainer with, you know, 10, 12 people at a time. Uh, and that's good. It's great. It's so much better than not doing anything at all. Right. I just want to be able to work one on one with people. Yeah, yeah. You and, and I share that. that factors. That Jack would be very proud of you to to do that because he 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 loved that one on one. And it's uh, great. you're doing. That's I got out of multiple gym business and big big chains uh, with lots of em employees. I just couldn't focus on the part of the business that I had a passion for. And that was working with people, understanding the exercise science of how, you know, the muscles worked and training the muscles in isolation through the full range of motion with equal failure, all those points. And then knowing what I know and my practical experience of training lots and lots of people over several decades, I can, I can really guide them and motivate them so that they, uh, they can achieve their goals. Yeah, and that, that makes so much more sense. Um, as you know, I have I share that same model in my business. Um, one thing you had mentioned the MedEx equipment. I'm not sure a lot of people know that Arthur Jones also invented that line. You may want to talk a little bit about the transition from Nautilus to MedEx. What brought that on with Arthur? 
and that uh, story. You know, he was a real perfectionist, and there were certain things that really started to bother him. Number one, there was some friction in the, in the Nautilus equipment, which um, detracted from the relationship between the contracting muscle fibers and the resistance factors. And he just started to think, how can I overcome that? How can I make it better? And there were other improvements that were made too, but with the medics equipment, there's no chains, cables, or guide rods. The weight stacks are lifted from underneath with a system of levers. So it virtually eliminates all of the friction. And so that brings about muscle fatigue probably faster and more deliberately than the conventional equipment. And uh, the weight stacks are what we call a compound weight stacks. There's 20 pound increments on the bottom stack, two pound increments on the top. And those can be used in combination. So you don't have to go from 20 to 40 to 60. You can go from 20, 22, 24, 26, 28. And, uh, and that's very helpful. And he's put a lot of time and detail into engineering so that the axis of rotation of the rotary joint that's attached to the contracting muscles are in line with the axis of rotation of the mechanical apparatus. So there's, 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 there's a lot of compatibility there. And that really cuts down on the injury factor. Yeah, talk about a visionary uh, and to be able to then bring that to fruition and then take it to the next level with the medics equipment. That's that's an amazing uh, progress. Well, then the thing that started the medics equipment was his uh, discovery of uh, of the of how to properly train and isolate the lumbar spine. So his whole key and his whole mission was trying to find a way to exercise all the muscles in total isolation. That's why there was a different machine for every body part, because he wanted to be able to isolate that muscle. He believed that the best way to strength train muscles is, number one, train them in isolation, train them through the full range of motion, train them with equalized resistance, meaning there's no dead spots in the load factor that's equal throughout the range of motion. And number four, train them to fatigue. So he got, he couldn't, he couldn't figure out how to isolate the lumbar spine. And he had a Nautilus machine that he thought was a low back machine, and it really wasn't, and we discovered that it was more of a glutes and hamstring machine. He actually got very depressed, went into isolation, and finally figured out how to crack the code on how to isolate the lumbar spine. And it's with a series of restraining devices where it pushes the femur into the pelvic structure, blocks it, Everything is restrained so that when you go into flexion and extension, there's no rotation of the pelvic structure. So you can't get any activation of the glutes and hamstrings, and it forces the isolated contraction of the lumbar spine. And it was that technology and the other improvements that were made that opened up the door for him to go ahead and produce a strength training line of the medics equipment. Well, okay, so obviously he had a strong background in engineering. Did he have what was he his did. medical? What was his medical background? We know Jack studied um, <clears throat> chiropractic because the traditional medical community right. didn't embrace what Jack was saying. What was Arthur's uh, experience there? I'll, I'll tell you where he got his medical background. His father and his mother and his sister were all medicals. They're all doctors. They're all MDs. So he grew up in that environment where he couldn't escape gaining knowledge, learning about it. And of course, I'm sure they wanted him to be a doctor. He didn't want any part of it. But he had that, that knowledge and that was his foundation. So then when he became interested in weightlifting and bodybuilding, he immediately realized the deficiency and the strength curves of barbells and dumbbells and started to think, how can I overcome that? So like on a typical uh, dumbbell curl, You've got resistance down in the lower area. When you get up here, there's no resistance because the weight is transferred from the bone. So he started experimenting, how can I make that better? He started with chains. So if a chain is on the ground and you pick it up, it's real light at the bottom. As you go up through the range of motion, it gets heavier, and that defeats the mechanical advantage of the, uh, of, of, of the, of the muscles and the bones. But it wasn't good enough for him because he wanted it to be equalized and that's when he started experimenting with levers and pulleys and cams. And that's when he designed the famous old cam that replicates the strength curve of, of all the different muscles on each machine as those, those muscles go into contraction. In the 30s, um, they had pulley machines. They, they mm -hmm. had pulleys, and they, but they didn't Mark. have a weight selector. And so that's when he, Bill, when you come here, you'll see 
the very first weight selector. You'll see all of the very first in, in the 30s, uh, the 1930s. Uh, That's on. Debbie and I want to do that for sure. We're going to yeah. try to figure that. Yeah. So Jack, Jack was an inventor also, and I give him a lot of credit because he was always thinking and, and, and how to, how to transport that, uh, those techniques out to the masses. So he did invent the first Smith machine. Yeah, and well, I've seen the cables and the leg. Yeah. He and oh. Arthur had a meeting of the minds in that respect, you know, and, uh, so, well, they, uh, they both believed in the you know, in the premise of uh, of, of, of weight. I I look. It's, if they were the same person, in the same body, in the same mind, uh, it would have been incredible because they had different different perspectives on fitness and different talents. Like Jack was was a huge motivator for masses of people, and he had a passion to teach people how to exercise and get them to join in. You know, with the TV show, I watched that TV show when I was a little tiny kid yeah. with my mother and my. But he was beyond that. I mean, he, he, um, he, 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 he didn't believe in the, uh, just just exercise and, and getting masses. He believed in the one on one. You know, just like yeah. you. Did. He, sure. He he, he I, on one person. You know. I also and, appreciate the fact that he was a chiropractor. Uh, I don't think a lot of people knew that. And he didn't go out and say, hi, I'm Dr. Jack Lane. No. That was kind of Let me in tell the you background. The story, uh, the story on that is in the 1930s, the uh, chiropractors and the MDs were not, they were like cats and dogs, you know? And so <laughs> they, um, so he could not tell. He had a lot of uh, MDs, a lot of Dr. Prasant, Dr. Lott. A lot of these these guys um, that worked out at his gym, they were m medical doctors, and so yep. he could not uh, he he could not tell everybody he's a chiropractor because he he wouldn't be very popular. <laughs> so uh, so he just I, kept quiet, you know, and and uh, and used his chiropractic degree and his he um and he and Gray's Anatomy was his bible. He he since since a teenager, uh, he that's what he did. He he studied Gray's Anatomy backwards, forwards, and sideways, and uh, he knew he mm. knew, he knew every ligament, every every bone in your body, every 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 part of your body. Yep. So they could name sure. them, you know. But he didn't do that on his TV because people didn't understand all that stuff, you know. <laughs> Well, you know what's fascinating about what Jack was able to do, and to your point, Bill, because, you know, you and I are in the one-on-one -on -one business, Jack was able to communicate that by looking into that camera and making you in that, you know, room feel like he was talking directly to you. That's so actually, there's a gift in that. I remember that as a kid. Yeah. As a matter of fact, sometimes when I don't have anything to do, I'll look at the old YouTube videos of his shows. Amazing. Just mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. Uh, he's one of a kind. He did not want to flaunt any of, any of that stuff. He, wh what do you think we're doing today? We're passing it on. Yeah. And that's all right. he wanted to do. He, he said, uh, I just want to, I want to help everybody help themselves. And so that's what, uh, uh, that's what he did. He just, and he didn't want he didn't want a pat on the back. He didn't want anything. He just wanted to help, and that's it. That's all he that's, that's all he lived for. I heard it every night at dinner. I heard it every day. I heard it twenty four seven of uh, how he felt about exercise and and what it does for you. And uh, but he didn't he didn't want to he, he he didn't he wasn't one of these guys. Here I am with all you know, and here I am with. You know, when we when we make personal appearances, the uh, press would say, "Hey, Jack, give us a muscle." You know, and he'd go, you know, but but uh, he was very Jack was basically a shy, shy person, but people don't know that, you know. So anyway, yeah, the behind the scenes, I know that you made a lot of things happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he actually came to one of your club's grand openings, didn't he, Bill? 
Did you he did, that? and uh, it was one of the aerobics on Boulevard, and, and Terry Robinson was there. He came in with somebody, one of his associates, and he wanted to see the Nautilus, and he was real impressed with what was going on. And you know, I'll tell you when I first I, I I did this in in the in the in the book, but when I first got into this business, my parents, my friends, my family, they thought I had lost my mind. They said, "You're going down a road that is a dead end or a cliff, <laughs> and you're going to get in this." Mm. And I had my doubt. I, something inside of me said, "Keep going, keep going." And right. he said, "Kid, this time fitness is here to stay. You're on the right track. Stick with it." Jack was asked by one of the press one time, he said, what do you think is going to happen to, uh, uh, you know, the fitness industry? And Jack said, it's going to explode and explode, yes. you know. So. Well, sure did. Bill, and there's you, Bill, you were there that at, the, at that explosion time because the mid to late 70s is when that explosion that jack was talking about occurred and you got in on the front end of that tidal wave and then ushered in the next generation my generation in the early 80s into the industry so really you know from from a pioneer standpoint you really were able to at the very beginning of that explosion jack was talking about take advantage of this amazing career that we now call fitness uh, and take it right. to the next level and he open was... the door to many more to come he was made fun of, called mm -hmm. a crackpot and not in a filbert. And this is, you know, filbert's a nut and, uh, and a crackpot. And uh, so he's, he, um, he, but he just forged ahead. He, he knew what he wanted. He knew what he believed in. He knew, he knew the workings of the body and he knew what it could do for you. And he's proved it ever since. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have, I, I, I'm 98 years young, and I, and I've met a lot of the people in the early early industry, and uh, they 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 can't believe what uh, what Jack knew in those days. You know, if you could bits of weight resistance exercises and put them in a pill, you'd have the wonder drug of the millennium. I go to the doctors, and I I just turned 70 about six months ago, and they say, okay, list your prescriptions. I'm not on any. Don't want to be on any. I find that's new, uh, and because I credit that with my lifestyle and the weight resistance exercise, Debbie and I live a very healthy lifestyle. We don't smoke. We don't drink alcohol. Uh, we uh, we exercise constantly, and and we we really watch what goes into our bodies. And I got to tell you, uh, a lot of that influence early on was Jack Olane. He had that. He had that part of it. Arthur didn't have that. There's another big difference between the two of them. Um, I'm not going to say anything negative about anybody, but no, he no, was not Arthur, on the same page. Arthur knew what he was doing, you know, and and uh, and uh, Jack admired, you know, Jack admired all those people that went into the business, and uh, and he was proud of them, and and, uh, and they're carrying on the torch, and uh, so just like you, are, Bill, you know so much. I don't take anything either. Well, I'm 98. You know what? Old and I don't take any pills. You know. I'm lucky because early in my life, I found something to do that I love doing. Yeah. I can't imagine what it's more like to work in a... To do that. More people need to yeah. do that. They need to yeah, find so something that they like. I love to come day, and I do work every day along with Debbie. And I just I just love, I love my work. And I'm lucky because I, I found something to do that I love. And it was complete accidental. It was serendipitous. I didn't start off in life to be in the fitness business. It just it just happened. I was in the right place at the right time. Right. No doubt about it. And and you know what? And, and if you have the instinct to then follow that passion, which you did, then it then it takes it to a whole new level. And it kind of reminded me, Bill, our mutual, very close friend, Kathy Friedrich, uh, was with us couple of weeks ago, we were talking about um, on the on the podcast, Elaine, you'll remember this. Um, after graduating from college, her degree was not in fitness. Um, and her parents told her, I did not, or her dad told her, I did not send you to college to do jumping jacks for a living. 
<laughs> now here we are, you know, 40 plus years later, and we've all made a pretty good career doing jumping jacks for a living. And, uh, uh, and um, no, we've just been blessed. You know, one of my favorite quotes of Jack's kind of going back to what you said earlier, uh, Elaine was, you know, he said, they used to call me a crackpot and a charlatan, but now they call me the authority. Yeah, and that was so true, because, um, you know, he persevered and opened the doors for you know, pioneers and, and leaders uh, like Bill to come along that then opened the door to my generation and all those uh, after me. So, you know, we're grateful certainly to Jack and to Arthur and obviously to Bill um, for opening the doors to the rest of us. From a junk food junkie smoking cigarettes, blowing yeah. smoke in Jack's face, I, um, I, uh, I changed my whole life around because he was so dynamic and so, so believable you yes know. that's why you're still here 58 years of age congratulations right. you made exactly. yeah, yeah. Uh, well six months i'll be 99 yep. 99 <laughs> and going strong hey bill thank so, you so much for passing on jack's mission how can people learn more about you your programs and basic training well, they can go to uh, our website, which is www.basictraining.scottsdale.com. And we also have another uh, site, which is gymtogo.com. That's a weight resistance exercise program that I developed for the submariners on, for the U.S. Navy that we decided to share with everybody so that they know how to use the rubber bands, uh, which, again, we can go right back to Jack Lane. He was a pioneer with the rubber bands for sure. Uh, and I believe that if you don't have anything or you're, there you go, if you're traveling, you can't beat rubber bands. Because no, it's, you it's, can't, you can't. Yeah, you can't beat them. You can't beat them. Uh, it's it's uh, progressive resistance, but it's still better than, you know, uh, dumbbells and barbells because mm -hmm. it, it uh, overloads the muscle with resistance through its full range of motion. And you can do everything, everything that you could possibly think of, you can do with rubber bands. They're great. Right. Lever and rubber. But as a matter of fact, with all the equipment that I have in here, I still have rubber bands hanging up over there. And we use those for specificity, especially on rotational joint injuries, uh, like the rotator cuff, uh, supraspinatus, infraspinatus. We still have the first glamour stretcher and the first easy way. <laughs> I I know Greg, can you show them the first one? Yeah, here we go. Got them right here. That's great. So great. Yeah, you were talking about yourself and Kathy Smith. I know you had a background actually in mining, right? Uh, oh my! So you, you giant leap. When I went out to Los Angeles, I had been uh, educated to do uh, graphic arts and advertising, and I was actually doing grids and things on buildings. And a guy comes up to me and says, "Hey, I'm opening up a gym. Can you paint my sign?" And so I did, and I immediately was struck by lightning. And I became his partner in the in second gym, and I and that's all I ever did ever since. But that's how I got into the uh, exercise business. And plus, I'd had an athletic background, being a you know downhill racer and training for that in Colorado. I grew up in a town uh, way up in the high mountains of Colorado. You you go to ski in a place oh, just yeah. a few miles away from it. Tell you right, I grew up in your race. And if you grow up in a place like that, kid, you're going to be fit incidentally just because of the topography and climbing up and down the mountains etc cetera, etc cetera. so i i had that instilled into me and then when i found the the gym business in los angeles where everybody was a little bit out of shape i thought this is in heaven i'm never going to look right i'm never going to look left i want to do this for the rest of my life and that's what i did well thank you so much you uh, put a lot of insight into us today Oh. Well, it's a pleasure to, to to talk with you and visit with you. I'm a big fan. Love you. Debbie sends her love and admiration as well. I, I, let me tell people about this couple. If you live anywhere near them, you must go visit them because they are the sweetest, wonderful. Most, I mean, I don't know if that's a word or not, but uh, <laughs> they are wonderful. And uh, they are wonderful people. And you better get over there and see his facility because it's, it's dynamite, right? Okay.